Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of this great church. We're just so blessed that you are joining us for our general Sunday School lesson overview. Uh, for the past three years, we've been sharing a general uh, lesson through our YouTube and Facebook pages, and so we praise God for all of you all that have been with us uh, during that time, that have supported us with your presence, with your time, and of course with your prayers. If this is the first time you stumbled upon this channel, we don't believe it's by accident, but we believe that it's a Holy uh, Spirit-inspired uh, occasion, and so we first thank you for your presence, we thank you for joining us. We encourage you to not only subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications, but to check out some of our other content, our Sunday morning worship, and our Wednesday evening Bible class. Your subscription and your views help us get this material out in front of many other people. And it's our prayer that not only are we able to encourage and strengthen believers in their own faith journey, but also non-believers that by some chance they might stumble, stumble upon our content as we continue to plan and water and trust God for the increase and the revelation of salvation in their life. So thank you for your uh, support as always, and we'll jump right into our lesson. We have a wonderful, wonderful lesson uh, taken from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, entitled, Healing a Man Who Cannot Walk. The key verse, it's Acts chapter 3, verse 8, and then the New King James Version, it reads, So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. So we have three goals in this lesson. First, we will examine what the blind man truly needed. Second, we will celebrate the gift of healing for both the body and the soul. And then third and finally, we will commit to responding to the greater needs of the people that God places in our lives. And so we're going to begin with prayer. We're going to do just a very brief background of Acts, and we'll jump right into our lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word. Father, we confess that we stumbled and fallen short, but we thank you for brand new graces and brand new mercies each and every day. Now, Father, as we break into this bread of life, reveal your will uh, and your purpose for our lives. Lift us up higher that we might see you clearer. Father, help us to uh, study and focus on your word so that we might be strengthened and encouraged along our daily walk. Bless each and every person that hears this lesson. Bless each and every Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of creation and continue to let your will be done both in our lives and around us. In your son Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. So again, I believe this is the fourth week or the third week in a row we're in the book of Acts. Uh, remember that the Acts is considered the Acts of the Apostles or the early history of the church. It's the first 30 years of the church. Uh, and these disciples, they were eager to begin their ministries. Uh, at first, they were fearful after the death of Jesus Christ. They weren't sure if they had followed the right person. Jesus calmed their fears. He revealed himself to them. And for 30, 40 days, Jesus walked around uh, Galilee, Galilee, excuse me, the, uh, the Galilean area the Jerusalem area, performed all these different miracles. And then, as the disciples were ready to leave, Jesus told them that they had to wait and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So last week's lesson, in Acts chapter 2, we see that God poured out his Holy Spirit amongst the disciples and other believers that were gathered together uh, for the feast, uh, the celebration feast. Uh, they were all in Jerusalem. And now this lesson, Acts chapter 3, picks up following the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so these disciples are eager to really start their ministry uh, they're eager to get rolling. They're eager to do the work that God has called them to do. They're coming off this spiritual high, a momentous occasion that not only in their lives, but throughout the entire church where God had now freely gifted the Holy Spirit for all those that believe. And so it energized them and it encouraged their work. And they were literally on fire for Christ. And I don't know how, uh, I'm sure that many of us can relate. We've left a great service this morning. I'm recording this on Sunday, May 7th for the next week's lesson. But this morning, just in worship service, we had a fiery message from Dr. Backus. As a matter of fact, if you can go back and look at it, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 4, just an amazing, amazing word from Dr. Backus. Service was amazing. The praise and worship team sounded amazing. And so when you're experiencing worship experiences like that, when just the Holy Spirit just settles on you and settles in the place like never before, you get on the spiritual high and you're just so excited and encouraged. You just believe that you can do all things through Christ according to his purpose. And that's the state that these disciples were in. So that's where we're picking up at chapter 3. These disciples are overly excited. They just received the gift of the Holy Spirit. All their fears and doubts about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ have subsided because of the work that Jesus did over the last 
40 days and then the past 10 days that they had without him. And this is where we pick up. So our lesson begins with the crippled man's encounter. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. And all of our scripture will come from the New King James Version. The text reads, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. So the lesson begins with Peter and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples, traveling to the temple for prayer, the second prayer of the day. Now Peter, Jesus said, this is the disciple that the church shall be built upon. And then we see uh, John, it was the disciple that Jesus loved. So two of his closest disciples, uh, out of the three that it was closest to him, Peter, James, and John, James is not mentioned as being present. But for the second consecutive time, uh, week, the time of day is given for context in the text. And so last week's lesson, when people uh, just tried to dismiss the disciples' reaction to the Holy Spirit as them being drunk, Peter reminded them that it's 9 a.m. and the quality of alcohol that's available, it's not possible that we're drunk this early. This week, the time is just as important for the context of the lesson. Normally, Jews would gather at the temple for the hour of sacrifice, which would take place prior to the ninth hour prayer, which would be 3 p.m. So around 2 p.m. or sometimes early, depending on the sacrifice, the, uh, the priest would begin to make the sacrifice to atone for sins. People would gather for the sacrificial uh, ritual, for the sacrificial ritual, and then they would stay for the 3 p.m. prayers. Peter and John specifically waited until after the time of the sacrifice, and most modern theologians believe that the purpose of this was they recognized that there was no more need for a sacrifice. Now, if we remember, Jesus, who was also recognized as the Lamb of God, gave his life and defeated death so that we might be saved. Previously, before the death of Jesus, there was no atonement for sin. And so the only way that people could reconcile or pay the price for their sins would be through blood sacrifice of an animal. Now that Jesus has died and risen from the dead for the sins of all of mankind, Peter and John, having understood the theology of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, recognized that there was no more necessity for blood sacrifice because Jesus Christ paid the entire debt of sin when he gave his life on the cross. And so there, there was no need for temple sacrifice because Jesus paid the full price. So as these two disciples, Peter and John, approached the temple for prayer, there was a crippled man, crippled from birth, laying at the gate. Now, the temple has a door that has been described as a 75-foot-high double door made from Corinthian brass, one of the most beautiful doors ever created. As a matter of fact, it marked the entrance of the second temple, and it was intentionally built in a way to restore Israel's pride and belief that God's presence was amongst the, uh, this building and it, they wanted to make it look like a house that was worthy for God to reside in. And so the second temple built uh, in Jerusalem, uh, and it was uh, just kind of throwing this in there, it was destroyed uh, during the, uh, the Roman rebellion in 70 AD, heavy documentation about how it was destroyed. It's an interesting story, uh, it's something that you might want to look into in your own. But this temple was built uh, by Nehemiah when they re uh, the, he began the rebuilding process after they left Babylonian captivity. And then it was uh, lasted for over 500 years. And so this temple uh, that stands as evidence of God's presence on earth for the people of Israel had one of the most beautiful doors made of Corinthian brass to the point where people said that doors similar in size that were made of pure gold or pure silver failed to compare to this temple door. And then the crippled man each day was positioned outside the temple because he had a belief that people entering and leaving would be more likely to donate to the poor. Now, in today's society, we struggle having accessibility for people with disabilities. 2,000 years ago, it was so much more worse. A debilitating disability basically cuts you off from society, and it puts you in a place where you are unable to work, and you are basically at the mercy of those that you encountered, begging that they would give you generosity and offer you food, clothing, and money. Now, we see the extent of this crippled beggar's condition based on the fact that the Bible tells us that he had to be carried and laid at the gate he was not even able to get himself there. So his entire life, his entire well-being is represented as being at the mercy of others. He can't feed himself. He can't work. He, ain't, he can't even get to the place to bed on his own. Furthermore, from an Old Testament Levitical perspective, and by Levitical I mean the law perspective, disabilities in the Bible were considered punishments or curses. They were seen as evidence of God's wrath for disobedience, for transgressions, for sin, for unbelief, or for ignorance. 
Now, evidence of this belief that disabilities were evidence of God's wrath in your life was rooted in the penalty of disobedience laid out in the law, specifically Leviticus 26, 14 through 16, where it says bad, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it written here, but it says that bad things will happen to you when you don't obey the Lord. So this crippled man was of no use to, in society beyond his position as a beggar. And the act, so now we understand the, the crippled man's position. Now the reason why he was at the temple is, is somewhat rooted in the same Levitical law, the uh, commandment to give and donate towards the work of the church. As an act of worship within the temple system, giving to the poor was commanded. And so both genuine worshipers and those who wanted to be viewed as being generous would go out their way to give to the poor as an act of obedience and worship to, of God in efforts to grow in their righteousness and grow closer to in their relationship with God. So people intentionally would give to the poor specifically when they were entering the temple, recognizing that their entire mindset was to go worship and ask for forgiveness, atone for their sins. And this was a way that they figured they could do the same. In the same manner, even those people that were not genuine in their, in their intentions or in their efforts, they would still give to the poor so that others would be seen, uh, others would see them giving and they would be placed in high esteem. And so uh, there's an old phrase that preachers use, you should never give to be seen, but you should be seen giving. It was both. People that wanted to be seen giving would give, and people that were seen giving in a general, I mean, in, in a genuine way, excuse me, were seen giving at this temple gate. So we looked at the crippled man's encounter. Now we move to chapter 3, verse 3, and we see the crippled man's request. Acts chapter 3, verse 3 reads, Who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms. So this man in the midst of his daily routine recognizes Peter and John as two potential givers, and the Bible suggests that he targeted them specifically. Now our first question, why this third verse separated, is separated from the previous uh, two or the subsequent verses that follow. Then I realize that there is an important truth revealed here in the text that we simply can't overlook. God has blessed me throughout my life, and thankfully, as of yet, I have never been in a position to bed others for money or food. Uh, but we understand that some people, uh, because of circumstances in life, because of the situation they find themselves in, they are left with no other choice but to ask for help from other people. So first, let's look at the probable, the probable appearance of people, Peter and John. We know from the three years that they spent with Jesus that, they're, uh, that they didn't have a strong financial situation. The disciples most certainly did not look rich, they did, most certainly did not wear fancy clothes, and they never moved with an entourage of servants. So they did not appear to be wealthy or people that just had extra money to spare. Secondly, if we look at the experience of the beggar, this man most certainly knew from being over 40 years old, and I'll show you later how we know that he's over 40, from being crippled from birth and over the age of 40, he most certainly knew who to target and who would most likely give in support of him. Therefore, we must assume that there was something about Peter and John that convinced this beggar that the two of them were a good group to ask for help. As Christians, we should carry ourselves in a way that draws others towards the light and the love that we have inside each and every one of us. We say these phrases all the time, and I don't know if we truly appreciate the depth of meaning that lies within them. We talked about drawing others out of darkness and into the marvelous light. We talked about that others might come running and see our good works but glorify our Father up in heaven. We say that others might come running and ask what must they do to be saved. When looking at verse 3, we should ask ourselves, what do people expect from us when they see us, when they see the way that we carry ourselves? What do people think that we have to offer? Of course, we should be willing to help those in need and give in order to support the poor, that's just a commandment of God, and that's what we're called to do, to show love whenever uh, we have the opportunity. Personally, within my own self, I have committed a specific amount of money each week uh, that I would give or, or offer to support of those in need. And this is beyond my general ties and offering and beyond the various organizations and efforts that I support. So I keep dollar bills on me according to that budget, and I give according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it all goes at once, uh, and there are times when I'm not led to give at all, or there's no opportunity that's readily available for me to give. And then in addition to that, I try to give more whenever I possibly can based on just the loose change or the dollars that I have in my pocket. 
As Christians, we should not only be willing to give, but we should be intentional and plan on giving to others, especially the poor, along our daily walk. In the Old Testament temple system, the children of Israel were commanded to give three one-tenth offerings. One were in support of the feast, one, were, one was in support of the Levites, and one was in support of the poor. Now, there was a culture of giving and support for the poor already established within the temple system, but after 400 years of silence from God during the intertestamental period, and due to the shifts in cultural and religious obedience due to the Roman occupation and the integration of other cultures and races in the Holy Land, the practice of giving to the poor was not as strong as it once was, and it had waned, to say the least, amongst, the, amongst believers. To say it uh, succinctly, it was no longer adhered to as it once was. Therefore, this was a man that was fully aware that he was not likely to receive a donation from everyone that entered the temple. So he had to use his experience and his wisdom to target the right people. So if we understand the uh, appearance of Peter and John, and we understand the possible tactics of the beggar, then we have to accept that there was something about Peter and John that attracted the man's attention and convinced him that they had something to offer. Outside of our appearance and our wealth, we as believers must carry ourselves in a way that attracts those that are lost and those that are searching for truth and help, that they look at us and say, he or she can help me in, the, in my situation. As believers, our prayer should be that we carry ourselves in a way that we smile, that we walk, that we talk, that we react, that we even drive in a way that people see something in us and are drawn to us, specifically those that are in need and searching for help. So we looked at the crippled man's encounter, verses 1 through 2. We looked at the crippled man's request, verse 3. Now we look at the crippled man's miracle, verses 4 through 6. Acts chapter four, 3, verses 4 through 6 reads, And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So in response to the man's request, Peter and John looked intently at the man, and the man prepares himself to receive something. It says that he expected them to give him something. Now to the man's surprise, Peter begins his, his part of the interaction by stating that they have no money to give to this man. What a change of events for this crippled man. Possibly missing out on other people that were willing to give by focusing on Peter and John. He gets their attention. They probably warmly turn to, towards him only to share that they have nothing to give in regards of money or food. I must admit that there are times in my life when I have nothing to offer people that are begging and I find myself somewhat ignoring their pleas or moving quickly past them. I would like to excuse this behavior as not wanting to get cursed out or not wanting to fail them or being embarrassed that I don't have anything to give. But sometimes the truth is that it's easier for me to keep it moving so I won't have to deal with the issues that other people are going through. Now, I'm specifically instructed to show love to others and at times, uh, 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 at, at all times, and plant seeds in the lives of others as I go about my daily walk. Those are commandments of God, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves and to plan as we go. During preparation for this lesson, I found myself somewhat convicted by God's Holy Spirit, recognizing that I have to do, I need to do, I have to do better when asked for help from those that are in need, even when I don't have money to offer. So Peter speaks for the two of them, and he says, silver and gold we don't have, but we give you what we do have. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Now, Peter and, and John, in their response, highlight what we as believers should carry with us at all times. Like the old American Express commercial said, Peter shows us that when it comes to the power of God, we should never leave home without it. Now, to offer someone something means that we must first have possession of it ourselves. In other words, you can't give what you don't have to give. That means that Peter and John carried the spirit and the power of God with them at all times. I believe that many of us have asked God or prayed to God for more power, power in our prayers, power in our living, power in our marriages, power in our health, power in our churches, power in our lessons, power in our sermons, power in our singing. We all desire to be more impactful and to have more power, especially when we're doing the work of God. And God gives us the power uh, uh, to not only through the power of God, change our own lives, 
but to also change the lives of the people around us if we have access and depend and lean on that power, if we have the faith to believe in that power. So Peter not only believes in the power that God has given him, but he relies on that power and offers that same power to other people, recognizing that the same way that power changed his life, it has the ability to change the life of others. And then Peter commands this man to get up and walk. Now, this must have caught the man off guard. He's asking for money uh, from two men that he believes that he, they can help. And instead of giving him money, they instead tell him to do what he has not been able to do his entire life. Regardless of what the man believed, we can be certain that Peter and John believed that they were able to give this man power of his limbs to be able to walk. The last three years of Peter and John's life have been filled with Jesus Christ performing miracles. Jesus was teaching, he was preaching, he was saving, he was helping the sick, giving sight to the blind, giving, uh, restoring the power for the cripple. He raised the dead, he fed thousands. They even saw Jesus walk on water and they most recently saw Jesus depart from their midst by being taken away into heaven by a cloud. Furthermore, these same disciples, Peter and John and the other nine that weren't with them were empowered by Jesus to perform miracles in the name of Jesus on their own. So their experience with Jesus and Jesus' power led them to believe that within the will of God and by the power of Jesus Christ, they could do anything. And they most certainly believed that they were able to heal this crippled man of his debilitating condition. As believers, we must have the faith, the belief that with the power of God and according to the will of God, we can do mighty things in the name of God. The Bible makes it clear. The faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. Our prayer sh should be that God increases our faith to be effective in the work that he has called us to do and to change the lives of the people around us according to God's purpose and for God's glory. So we looked at the crippled man's encounter, verses 1 and 2, the crippled man's request, verse 3, the crippled man's miracle, verses 4 through 6. Now we look at the crippled man's praise, Acts chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. The text reads, and he took them by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. So Peter's faith moves from mere words to action as he takes the hand of the crippled man and commands that man to lift, uh, to stand up and uh, walk. Peter didn't wait for this man to obey. He didn't wait to see if this commandment actually worked. Peter believed in the power of his words before there was evidence that his words had power. I'll say it again. Peter believed in the power of his words before it was evidence that his words had power. The evidence of the power of God is not in what we see, but rather it lies in what we know and what we believe. The Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not received. Just a few weeks ago, I remember talking with Pastor Backus, and I asked him the question that if we had access to a time machine, would he want to go back and see if Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And pastor said, that would be interesting to see, but I don't think I would need to because I have faith I don't need to see it. I agree with him, and I laugh because that's exactly the same answer I gave myself when I asked myself the same question. Our faith should not wait for worldly confirmation, but our faith should instead extend beyond the expectations and the restrictions of this world. We serve a mighty God, and we don't need worldly approval or confirmation to act in our faith or to act on our faith. The scripture says that as soon as the man was lifted up, his bones received strength, and he began to leap and walking, excuse me, he began to leap, walking and jumping as he entered the temple praising God. This man most certainly, most certainly uh, did not expect his day to turn out the way that it just did. Being crippled from birth and stuck in a seemingly hopeless situation, this man is led to request help from Peter and John, and they acquiesce, giving the man more than he could ever hope for. Some of us limit the power of God in our lives. All he asked for was money, alms, meaning money, food, or some other gift that can assist him in his debilitating condition. Yet Peter and John weren't able to give him what he asked for, but what they gave him was so much more. We need to stop dictating how God will fix our situation. If they gave him silver or gold or a couple of dollars, he might have been able to eat for that day, but his condition would have remained the same. Instead, they healed him, giving him what he did not even expect 
or think could be given, and now he was in a position where he could take care of himself and no longer need to rely on others. My brothers and sisters, we need to remove the limits and the ceiling and the box that we place our God in and under. Our God is so much bigger than what we could ask or what we could expect. I've, long, I've learned long ago to stop asking God for specifics. God, I don't need $50 to pay this bill. I need you to do, take care of this however you will. Lord, I don't need this to go this way. I just need you to work it out for my good according to your glory. And I promise you, the sooner that we stop trying to force God to do things our way and take our hands off and allow God to take control, the sooner things will start to work out for our good in a much better and stronger and more evident way. Uh, the phrase, Jesus takes the wheel, literally means that you're letting go and allowing God to take control. And it's, uh, we, say, we used to say we take our burdens to the Lord and leave them there. However you want to justify it in your own life, as believers, we should recognize that when we place limits on God or put specific requests into God, sometimes we restrict what he's willing and able to do in our lives because we are not looking for God's move. Uh, God's move. We're waiting for what we want. So this once crippled man first rejoices with leaps of joy. Then he goes directly into the temple and begins to worship God. First, it shows that this man recognized where his blessings came from, and he thanked God through his worship. Secondly, it shows that this man used his deliverance to be a living testimony so that others could see the good works that God had just done in his life. This man did not go play basketball for the first time or go fill out job applications so he could finally make some money, but rather this man used all that he had just received and gave it back to God in worship. When we are blessed, we must have the discipline to recognize where our blessings come from, and show and thank God by using those blessings for God's glory. Each of us should do an inventory within our own lives, recognizing all the blessings that God has given us and making sure that we are using those blessings for the glory of God. It does no good to have the best voice and not use it to sing for the glory of God. It does no good to not cook the best sweet potato pie this side of heaven and not use it to cook for the glory of God. It does no good to not have accesses to wealth and resources and not use them for the glory of God. It does no good for God to heal us and we not use our renewed and newfound strength for God's glory. So we looked at the crippled man's encounter, verses 1 and 2, the crippled man's request, verse 3, the crippled man's miracle, verses 4 through 6, and now the crippled man's praise, verses 4 through 8. We conclude this lesson with the crowd's amazement, Acts chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. The text reads, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat, at the, at, who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to see them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So our lesson concludes with the amazement of the people, the witnesses, the people that had spent their lives going in and out of this temple. Recognizing this jumping man as the cripple who had long laid at the temple gates begging, those who witnessed his worship immediately were amazed at his newfound abilities. Now if we fast forward to Acts chapter 422, this man is, being, is identified as being over 40 years old which means that this community for the last 40 years witnessed this crippled man beg for assistance and not be able to get himself uh, in, uh, to the temple gate without the help of others. It is very likely that some of the people that were watching him jumping and worshiping had previously given to him, or it is even possible that some of them had helped carry him to his usual, usual position outside the gate. What better way to reveal the true and unlimited power of God in the eyes of others than to make ourselves a living testimony. Our job as believers is to respond to God's work in our lives in a way that will glorify God and edify him, lift him up before the people. We should embrace opportunities to share with others that have witnessed our struggles, the wonderful things that God has done in our lives so that they can be convinced of the power of God to change our lives and recognize that that same power can change their lives as well. We may not be crippled, but all of us used to be something. And whatever you used to be, we can thank God today that even though we're not what we should be, we thank God we're not what we used to be. We should embrace opportunities to share with others that have witnessed our struggles, the wonderful things that God has done and continues to do in our lives. Many of us are living testimonies of God's glory, 
and we should embrace opportunities to show just how far God has brought us. We are no longer what we used to be, and we can find joy in celebrating the changes that God has brought about in our lives, and we can find even more joy in sharing that testimony and that change with other people. Because if God can do it for me, surely he can do it for you. What a wonderful lesson. Thank God for your presence as always. I was really encouraged by this lesson. I was convicted by this lesson. I have already prayed to God and start working on ways where I could be a better uh, giver to those that are in need, where I can respond to the needs of others better to those that are in need, even in times when I don't have money to give. And I would pray that you would do the same in your life, that you would ask God, are you giving enough? And are you uh, the best giver that you can be? And then ask God that even when you don't have money or food to give, that God gives you something. And that's the power of God that he has placed inside each of us by the gifting of his Holy Spirit the moment that we believe. What a wonderful lesson. Thank you for your time, your presence, and as always, we thank you for your prayers. Thank you for worshiping with us in your study. We always encourage you to worship with us in your giving. And what a better, what better lesson to uh, request uh, that you give than this lesson today. God loves a cheerful giver. And so here at Friendship, we are a tithe-believing church where we believe that we give back to God a portion of the blessings that he's already given us a tenth. And then if you're not a member of Friendship and you would just like to sow a seed here and support the work and ministry that we do, we encourage you to seek out the guidance of the Holy Spirit and make a donation towards the work here. We do have four ways for you to give. You can give on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462. You can give on Cash App, dollar sign Friendship Chicago, or as always, you can send your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church Care of Dr. Reginald E. Backus, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. As always, for those of you all that have given, we thank you for your sacrifice and your uh, gift. For those of you all that are considering to give, even if not here, we just ask that you follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit and support the work of the church somewhere so that we can continue to do what God has taught us to do. As always, we encourage you to support the other ministries that we have here at the church. Each Tuesday at 8 a.m., we have a prayer call led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson. The phone number and access code are on your screen. It's where we call out the names of each person on our sick and shut-in list, and we ask God's will to be done not only within our congregation and community, but throughout all of creation. Each Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., the layman meet led by our layman chairperson, Deacon James Lucas. Uh, they have Bible class and they, have, uh, uh, they do service projects and just build together as men. Each Tuesday, the fourth Tuesday of each month, the woman of faith led by our first lady, Lady Detra Backers, meet together. They do Bible class. They do service projects. A wonderful group of women that continues to make a huge impact in the church, sometimes behind the scenes, but does so much uh, to help those that are in need. A lot of blessings that they give around Christmas time, and they just sponsored an amazing event uh, last week uh, in preparation uh, for uh, death, teaching us that we can make uh, take care of our business before we put our families in a position to make arrangements for us. Each Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., we have Bible class taught by our pastor, Dr. Reginald Backus. We are currently in the final lesson of our Healthy Living Financial uh, Workshop, and so we'll be starting a new lesson next week. Uh, so this lesson this week, uh, this May 10th, will be the last one of this portion, and then we'll start a new series uh, the next week after that, May 17th. And then each Sunday morning at 11 a.m., we encourage you to join us for our in-person worship service where you'll hear some of the best preaching this side of heaven from our pastor, Dr. Backus. Uh, we're excited this second Sunday. Today, if you're watching it, on Sunday, May 14th, will be the first day of Children's Church here at Friendship Baptist Church. We have lessons specifically designed for the young people. The children will leave out morning worship, and we'll have a small service in the, in the fellowship hall, and then come back in before Dr. Backus concludes this, uh, the worship service. So we're excited that we're starting something new here at Friendship. Please pray for our young people and pray for our children's services, and we'll just make sure that we follow God's direction and seek God's uh, will in all of our efforts concerning our children's church ministry. That being said, as always, we thank you again for joining us for our Sunday School Overview. It is our prayer that God will reveal his will in your life, that you be blessed and strengthened according to God's purpose and because of the word that you've heard today. Uh, so we'll dismiss in prayer, and prayerfully we'll see you at 11 a.m. for worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to study your word. Father, help us to understand that you have called us to give, and all that we have comes from you. So help us to be uh, intentional in our giving, 
to give cheerfully, to give in response to the commandment in our life, but to give because there might be a time that we are in need ourselves and we would want others to help and support us during those times. Father, we are taught to treat others as we would be treated, to help us to show the love of God and all that we do, all that we say, all that we are, so that others might see our good works but glorify you, our Father, who is in heaven, and come running. What must they do to be saved? And we'll be careful to give your name all the glory, all the praise, and all that we do, all that we are, and all that we say. A special prayer for our pastor, Dr. Bacchus. Uh, continue to bless him and strengthen him according to your will for this church and for his life. Bless his family, bless his preaching, bless his teaching, bless his ministry, and give him all that he needs to continue to do a great work here at Friendship Baptist Church. Bless our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, a Herculean task he's taking on, ensuring that we continue to share our lessons, both virtually and each of our classes continue to meet during this COVID pandemic. Give her the strength and the perseverance that she needs to carry on and for her to realize that even though she's come a mighty long way, that God, you still have need of her and that there's still more work to do. Then bless each and every Sunday school instructor and student, specifically and especially those that are listening right now. Continue to bless us and strengthen us and encourage us according to your will and for your glory that we might have all that we need to face the challenges of life. We might be encouraged according to your purpose and that we might stand boldly on your word. Help us to understand that we do not know all things. So, Father, by the guiding of your Holy Spirit, help us to seek out wisdom and understanding. We may not under, only comprehend your word, but be living examples of your word, that we might be living testimonies, that others might see the power of God through our lives, through our language, through our words, and through the ways that we treat others. Bless this church. Bless each and every person that's on this call, listening or watching, and we'll be careful to give your name the glory and praise in all that we do. It is in your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful lesson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support as always. And most importantly, thank you for your prayers. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And if the Lord says the same, we'll see you next week for another Sunday School Lesson Overview. God bless.